how do you make sure that you're going to spend time studying? Let me show you an effective plan. G'day, welcome to Crystal Clear Mathematics, where it is easier than you think, and I'm your host, Graham Henderson. There are good and bad ways to plan your study time. Most of us need some kind of structure to reach our study goals, and for most of us, that means a study timetable. Now, I'm sure that you've tried to stick to a study timetable before, and no doubt your parents or your teachers have encouraged you to do so, but you weren't able to stick to it, were you? So you became discouraged and gave up. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. Neither your parents nor your teachers could stick to a study timetable either. You need to understand that all timetables fail. Even the space shuttle launches were delayed because of things like weather and bee swarms and the like. Train timetables fail, bus timetables fail, your school timetable fails. Even from day to day, you'll find that lessons are cancelled because of excursions or you don't arrive because of sickness or something. But timetables are there as a structure. Even your study timetable will fail. It'll fail because of things like sickness, uh, excursions, parties, friends coming over to stay, visitors, relatives visiting, uh, sick or dying pets, all manner of things will interfere with your study timetable. And that's why I consider a study timetable of secondary importance to the study graft and keeping track of your time. Now, it's still good to have a study timetable in the same way that it's good to know that, for example, every Tuesday night you go to sports practice. But just be aware that these timetables will fail and you will not be able to stick to it every week. Now let's seize the opportunity and set up your study timetable right now. I want you to download the timetable and you can do that by clicking on the link in the description at the bottom of this video or appropriately enough for looking ahead, uh, you can click on the telescope behind me. Pause the video now while you do this. First, I want you to create a draft timetable to see how busy your week is. I want you to spend a few minutes shading in all the time in the week that you've already got committed. That is, I want you to shade out the time you're at school, the time that you travel to and from school, shade in the time that you sleep in in the morning, Shade in your sleep time in the evening. Meal times, including any time that you prepare or clean up. Any times of sport or music practice. Work. That is everything except free time and time that you're currently studying. So all the commitments that you have during the regular week. If you have something that moves around during the week, for example, uh, your work schedule, just estimate an amount of time and place it somewhere where it appears most often. When you finish blocking out your week in this way, add up all the remaining time. This is all the time that you have available for your study and for your free time. And write that figure down at the top right hand corner of your blocked in timetable. Now this is a very revealing figure that you've just written. It shows you the amount of time that is potentially available to you for study. I sometimes meet students who are busy from the time they wake until the time they fall asleep at night. And in the entire week they might have as few as 10 hours available to them. I meet other students who are relatively uncommitted, very uncommitted and might have as many as 50 or 60 hours uncommitted during the week. Now, if you've set up a study graph and you've been filling it in even just for a week or two, you'll have a fairly good idea of the amount of time that you spend each week on school-related activities. That means that you now have two figures, 
you have the figure on your timetable showing you how much time in the week that you have available and you have a figure from your study graph showing the actual number of hours that you do study each week. And these two figures present you with the opportunity to make two decisions. Decision number one is to choose the number of hours you are actually going to work. Why is it important to be conscious of how many hours you work? Because it's the simplest measure and the simplest way to monitor your study efforts. Everyone wanting to excel in their field will either have regular training times and train for a given length of time or train through a set number of exercises. Since your homework and study exercises will vary enormously in scope and difficulty, it makes good sense to use the amount of time that you spend to keep track of your training. Almost all top students claim that their time management was one of the major reasons for their success. So, how many hours will you choose to commit to regular schoolwork each week? My suggestion is to set a goal that's achievable, not one that you're likely to fail to reach. For example, if you're currently spending just three hours a week studying, you might consider five to seven hours as you're very unlikely to jump to 15 or 20 hours, for example. If you're already spending 12 hours per week and you want to increase that, then you might increase your goal to 15 or perhaps 20 hours. Remember that the more time you spend, the greater your academic rewards will be. I'll talk later about how to spend the time effectively and how to live a balanced life, but for the moment we're just setting time aside. Pause the video now while you consider your goal and then turn it back on for the next step. So you've now chosen a goal for the number of hours that you're going to commit to study. That means we now come to decision number two and that is the lifestyle changes that you will need to make to reach that goal. I want you to develop a study plan that is sustainable and feasible one that you can stick to for a long time. Now remember that figure that you wrote on the top right hand corner of your blocked in study timetable? I want you to divide that figure by three because normally that's the amount of time that I find that students can comfortably commit to study. If your new goal is less than that figure, you should be able to manage quite comfortably. If, however, you have chosen to spend more than this number of hours studying, you may encounter problems. As I said, my experience is that students new to the rigours of study will have difficulty committing to more than one third of their unallocated hours. Your body and your mind need time to rest and you need time to, as it were, veg out and relax. So you have three options to be able to stick to your timetable if your goal is that high. You could revise your study goal. It could be that you're wanting to study for too many hours per week at this stage. That's one possibility. You could try to be extraordinarily disciplined and that does work for some people. Or you could make some lifestyle decisions and reduce the number of other commitments that you have each week in order to make time for your study. This will be your choice, your motivation, your discipline. Whichever of those three options you choose, you must be determined to stick with your choice and live with the consequences of your choice. So choose one of the options now and make the appropriate adjustments. I suggest you pause the video at this stage. Now, I don't mean to sound harsh, uh, it's simply that we're trying to be practical and if you have set your goals fairly high then you do need to somehow make decisions to accommodate them. Remember that you can reevaluate your study plan at any time but it is a good idea to try to stick to your new commitment for four to six weeks to give your new lifestyle a chance to become a habit. Now you're ready to plan out your week 
Print out a clean timetable and highlight the times each day when you will study. Make sure that the total number of hours per week on your timetable matches the goal that you've just chosen. A little word of advice. Do not allocate time that will conflict with activities that you especially enjoy, like a favourite TV show. Uh, you know what will win. It can also help to write the name of a particular subject in each hour or half hour slot so that if you can't think of anything to do at that time, you can simply study the subject that's written on your timetable. Now I should mention at this stage that some students have very, very good drive but don't like to be restricted to a timetable. And if this describes you, then just use the graph to monitor how you're going. However, if your drive and motivation are poor and you need a little bit of structure and discipline, then the timetable is definitely for you. Now that you've decided to work towards a particular number of hours per week and you've set up a study timetable to help you get there, I want you to get your study graph and to draw a horizontal line showing where on the graph your goal is. And as you record your study times during the next few weeks, you'll notice that your figures will hover up and down around that goal. Of course, if they fall behind your goal for a few weeks, you know that you have to work a little harder to catch up. But if you find that you're in advance for a few weeks, you can afford to rest and, and take some time off. This graph is actually more important than your study timetable. A study system should never be built upon a timetable only because timetables fail. You'll probably never have a single week where you're able to stick to it properly. But it does form a framework and a guide for you. It's the graph that keeps track of your fluctuating study from week to week. Congratulations! Your study timetable and your study graph are two of the four key things that you need in place for a good study system. One guides and the other monitors. See our next video to learn about the third part of the study system, that is the part that deals with your motivation. This is Graham Henderson looking forward to helping you study effectively. Please subscribe, like or comment on this video. Thank you.